a travesty of justice and honoring the first American casualty in Afghanistan. That's coming up on today's episode of The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, I'm on my last day of vacation, getting ready to start traveling again, but let's talk about when American forces first entered Afghanistan back in 2001. Back then, members of the CIA's ultra-secret Special Activities Division were among the first boots on the ground. A former Marine Corps captain was among them. His name was Johnny Mike Spann. And in 1999, Mike joined the CIA and became a member of the agency's paramilitary unit in the Directorate of Operations. Dozens of paramilitary officers, the actual numbers still classified, were all dispatched to Afghanistan to assist the U.S. Special Operations Forces in equipping and arming and training and supporting the troops who were flooding into Afghanistan after the attack on 9-11. Now, Mike Spann was among the first of these Special Activities Division guys to volunteer for duty there. During the last week of September, SAT operatives were deployed to establish a forward base for military special operators to follow on. Once on site, Mike and his teammates vetted Afghans for duty with the Northern Alliance and organized intelligence collection analysis cells for operations against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and conducted counterintelligence activities. Now, during the fight for Mazari Sharif, more than 300 Taliban fighters surrendered and were taken into custody by the Northern Alliance forces, and they were imprisoned in the city's 19th century fortress there. But because the de- detainees had potential and intel value on the capabilities and whereabouts of key Taliban kingpins, SAD officers were assigned the task of interrogating them. So on November 25th, Mike Spann and his partner arrived at the prison and began to conduct interrogations. That's how they discovered one of the detainees wasn't an Afghan at all. He was an American. His name was John Walker Lind. According to Lind, He was a convert to Islam and had traveled first to Pakistan and then Afghanistan with the intention of joining Al-Qaeda. Shortly after being interrogated by Mike Spann, Lind and his fellow prisoners overpowered their guards and murdered Spann with two gunshots to the back of his head, making him the first American casualty in the U.S. war on terror. Now, Mike Spann was 32 years old when he died at the hands of those murderous terrorists who had joined the jihad. Mike left behind a widow, Shannon Spann, and an infant son, and two young daughters, one of which I became friends with a while back. Now, for his part, Lind was one of only a few dozen to survive that uprising, and he was brought back to the United States and put on trial in federal court in February 2002. He pleaded guilty to two charges and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Now, fast forward to last week, May 23rd, 2019. Lind was released under early supervision. It was pretty contentious, that decision. And to talk about it more, I want to go over to my fr- my friend, former Delta Force commander and former Undersecretary for Defense and Intelligence under George Bush, my friend, General Jerry Boykin. General Boykin, it's good to see you again. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about this uh, John Walker Lind getting out of prison and uh, how, how you feel about it and what you know. Yeah. Hey, it's good to see you too, Chuck. And uh You know, the fact that uh, we are releasing a guy that turned on his country, that actually fought with the enemy, that actually is probably responsible for unknown numbers of deaths and injuries of Americans. It's just bizarre that we would release this guy early. And I think that if you if you look at the laws of the land, what he did is probably punishable by death. Oh, it's treason, yeah. without a doubt. Uh, and no not question. only that, but it sounds like he's unrepentant at this point. Well, he is, uh, based on what uh, the reports are that are coming out, that he has uh, he has been very uh, unwilling to recant uh, his earlier uh, condemnation of America, and that he still call, is calling for basically jihad. He's calling for evil to be perpetrated against the United States. And we're going to let this guy out. I guess he's, you know, he's been uh, there and, and, and they're letting him go on good behavior. But then stop and think about the people that have fought in Afghanistan honorably that are in jail today mm-hmm. and are, are being, you know, jailed for long term sentences 
because they killed a Taliban or they killed a Al Qaeda and and under what was considered questionable circumstances. I think this is a miscarriage of justice. It's a travesty. And I'd really like to know who the judge is that allowed this to happen. Yeah, for sure. Uh, now, that sort of begs the larger question, too, of um, what do we do with all these people? I, I've been talking with our friend Dave Eubank, and uh, you know he's in Syria right now. You just came back from over there, and uh, he's you know at these camps where we've got 70,000 ISIS uh, wives and children. There are thousands and thousands of uh, ISIS fighters in detention over there. And the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Kurds, don't, they don't have the funds to continue to uh, support these people. What do we do with these massive numbers of enemy combatants, and uh, especially the ones who we are very sure are going to be a problem in the future? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, I so appreciate the Kurds and uh, their willingness to fight uh, in support of, uh, you know, American values as well as you know, their own individual values, and they have been very successful in rounding these people up and getting them off the streets and getting them out of the fight. Now they have a problem, and I think this is where some kind of international relief effort has got to come into play. I'm not advocating turning anything over to the UN, but I am advocating that uh, the international community needs to help build facilities. There needs to be some kind of agreement as to where we can put these people. Because the last thing you want to do is turn a jihadist loose mm -hmm. uh, on an assumption that he will no longer be an, a jihadist. The women and children is another story. Again, there's got to be humanitarian relief for them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, you know, I, I certainly hate to see them incarcerated. But uh, the men, you, you got to have an international program that will keep them detained for an indefinite period of time because they are not going to change their stripes. Yeah, they're not. And we've still got uh, guys at uh, Guantanamo. And I think that we ought to keep that open and even expand it. I've been down there, and you've probably been there as well. Uh, it's not uh, it's not terrible conditions for uh, considering the kind of people that are getting put down there. Uh, and we have seen where when the Obama administration allowed guys to leave, for example, when they traded those, uh, what, four or five jihadis for Bo Bergdahl, that yeah. those guys are now sitting in the seats of power in Afghanistan uh, or in Doha or wherever they happen to be, but uh, they're, they're actually calling the shots in the continued fight against the United States. Yeah, and their, their calls have been intercepted right back to the same terror networks that they came from when they were captured. And uh, we know, and we knew basically anybody that knew anything about the terror networks, the jihadi networks knew that when we released these people, they were going to become, first of all, heroes among their peers in the terror networks. And then secondly, they were going to get right back in the fight. And we've intercepted their calls as they were talking to the leadership of these terror networks. So we know they're back in the fight. That was a bad trade. That was something that uh, previous administration uh, did things just like releasing John Walker Lynn now, that were totally unexplainable and hard for me to understand. So do you imagine that uh, President Trump might do something or could do something to uh, to reverse this or to change it? Well, you know, you, you've seen Mr. Trump uh, respond to uh, these kinds of things before when he gets enough uh, support from the people. And I think if there was a, a, you know, a lot of information going to Mr. Trump in the form of calls and letters, and and uh, I think that he would be inclined to say, no, why are we releasing this guy? He's a practical guy. He's a common sense guy, and that's what he responds to. And I think if he saw that veterans, especially, mm -hmm. were outraged about letting this punk go, and I think that there's a good chance that he would he would do something to commute this sentence. I don't know what the law says. I don't know whether he has the authority to do this, but I would assume that he does. But I think that enough pressure, I think he would reverse this. Right. Uh, so 
if we talk about uh, the, 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 the culpability this guy has, I mean, we look at, uh, he was there when uh, Mike Spann was yeah. killed, the first uh, American casualty in 2001. Uh, I've spoken with uh, Spann's daughter. Uh, she's outraged by this. She can't, she can't believe that uh, here it is, not even 20 years later, and he's already uh, being, being released. And actually, she fears that he poses a threat because, he's, uh, because of his statements, because of his uh, uh, unwillingness to uh, say he was sorry for this or anything. And um, I think just out of respect for the, for the sacrifice of those Americans, it probably would be the best thing uh, to, to keep him. Actually, uh, as Jocko Willink uh, likes to say, maybe instead of sending him to Guantanamo, we ought to just send him to hell where he belongs. But, <laughs> but yeah. uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, we don't live in that kind of a society uh, anymore. Yeah, you know, uh, it's hard to understand what, what causes a guy like uh, Lind to, to turn to, to such radical theology and radical behavior. I mean, this guy, he, this is not a guy that was recruited in prison. This is not a guy that was recruited out of the, the hood in mm-hmm. South L.A. I mean, this is a guy that had a pretty comfortable life, and you really wonder what turned him. Mm-hmm. And and given the fact that he is not repentant now, that he continues to advocate the same thing, you have to be realistic and say, if 17 years of incarceration has not done anything to change this guy's uh, perspective, this guy's theology, this guy's behavior, then do you really not expect him to go right back into a terror network to really be a threat to the community that he's in or the people that he's around? I think it's foolish to think that he is in any way uh, a better man than he was when he was uh, captured. I'd say so. Uh, so you just returned from Iraq, and uh, tell me a little bit about your trip. How'd that go? Yeah, it was a good trip. Uh, I was there right before they ordered the evacuation of the embassy, and Chuck, it was uh, we were up with the Kurds up in uh, Erbil. You've been there mm-hmm. uh, many times, and. Uh, we were there in Erbil, and the first thing that strikes you uh, is that Erbil is a very nice kind of a modern city. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you look at the rest of Iraq and you look at Baghdad and so forth, you, you say, well, my goodness, here's, a, here's an oasis in the middle of a, a, a desert, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Kurds were most hospitable. And uh, as far as I am concerned, the Kurds are, are some of the strongest allies we've ever had. You know, they've, they fought with us when we needed them. And then uh, we've abandoned them, yeah. which is, yeah. I think, a real black mark on our record. And the Kurds said to us, uh, we met with the prime minister, uh, among others, and the prime minister said, listen, we want to be your friends all the time, not just when you need us. And what we did after the first Gulf War is we walked off and left them after they fought with us. And then we did it again in 2011. Mm-hmm. And here's what we did, Chuck. And this is one of the things that I really blame the previous administration for. When we left in 2011, rather precipitously, we said, we're, we will supply you arms and materiel. Well, guess where that arms and materiel went? Well, it went to Baghdad. For the Kurds, it went to Baghdad. Yeah. Now, yeah. Where does, what did Baghdad do with it? They gave it to the Shia militias. Yeah. And the yeah. Shia militias then attacked Kurds with materiel that we had promised to the Kurds and wound up given to the Shia militias through the Baghdad government. Yeah, it's almost like saying that we're going to support South Korea by sending arms and weapons to North Korea. I mean, it just doesn't yeah. make any sense. That's right. And that's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we owe the Kurds. And uh, we ought to be fighting for a homeland for the Kurds. Mm-hmm. They've got, a, you know, Kurdistan, which is a semi-autonomous region. They don't have uh, the kind of authority that they would have as a sovereign nation. They don't have the kind of freedom they would have as a sovereign nation. Look, the Kurds are, are, should have a, they should have a homeland. Yeah, I mean, you know? if I was president and had my way, we would uh, shut down Inserlik tomorrow and move it to Erbil in a heartbeat. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And I'm not advocating that we create a homeland in Turkey, but I'm advocating that that area in northern Iraq mm-hmm. that is called Kurdistan today should ultimately be a sovereign nation. I agree. Well, thank you for your time, General. It's good to see you again. I hope you have a good day, and uh, we'll get you back on again soon. Hey, Chuck, it's always good being with you, bud, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Okay.
Well, that's all I've got to, for today, folks. Uh, go back and peruse the last 123 episodes of this program. We've brought you some absolutely powerful interviews with some very high caliber guests. Now, if you've been watching the show, you've heard a lot of the news before it broke in the mainstream media. I'm busting my hump out here to bring you really good content that'll make you smarter about the most pressing issues of, of our day. So if you're enjoying it, do me a favor. Go subscribe over at iTunes or Podbean or YouTube. And for three bucks a month at patreon.com slash hot zone, you can be part of the inner circle and get lots of cool extras. So go do that right now. Only takes a second. And it's really encouraging to me. So thanks for watching. I'm Chuck Holton, and this has been The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.